Yeah, question? Oh, welcome everyone to our Keeping Current today. Um, we have uh, two talks as usual. Uh, refreshments are up to you, I'm afraid. Uh, first up, we've got Jacob Schleuter talking about hedonic games. Are you here, Jacob? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. There you are. Um, if you want to, um, let's see if... Uh, uh, oh, Tess is mute. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Jacob, that you can uh, share your screen. If All you can't, right. uh, I will make you a co-host and that will allow you to show your screen. Can you try? Uh, let's see, it currently says host disabled participant screen sharing, so. Okay. Um, but. Now, now you are. And, uh, uh, and what I'm mm -hmm. gonna do is I'm going to um, mute everyone. Uh, VTech, I'm gonna mute you in, in, in addition. And then I'm gonna, uh, uh, and then um, Jacob, could you please unmute yourself? Great. Yes, I can do that. Great. Okay, I think we're set to go then. Jacob, if you want to take over. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Finkel. I... Okay. <clears throat> Had my slides on my other screen, so <clears throat> just needed to turn my chair around a bit there. Okay, now we should be good to go. Okay, so uh, I will be talking today about two general topics both within the area of hedonic games. First I'll be, well, first I'll be giving some background for both of these areas and then I'll be moving in to talk about super altruistic hedonic games and later internal stability. Uh, I will be trying to keep the talks fairly short. So as you can see, I've got about 27 slides and we'll see, uh, I'll make sure to wrap up by that half hour mark. Okay, so first of all, we're going to start with some background. Um, I figured it would be nice to start the uh, slides with something a bit refreshing. So here we have a nice picture that I took a while back when I was in uh, Singapore uh, doing some research with Dr. Zick there. But uh, yeah, just something a bit refreshing before we get into the uh, real meat baby. of everything. Uh, VTech, could you please mute? So uh, the first thing I'll go over is some basic definitions uh, into the uh, field. First of all, hedonic games fall into the uh, area of cooperative games. And this, this, uh, this means that this means that uh, agents need to be able to cooperate with each other in order to achieve their goals. Uh, we also will talk about coalitions, which are just a subset of the overall set of agents. Singletons, which is just a agent that ends up by itself. And partitions, which is a set of disjoint coalitions that divides up all of the different agents. So now getting into hedonic games themselves. So the full title for these in most cases is hedonic coalition formation games, but it is all, they're often referred to simply as hedonic games. And these are cooperative games with non-transferable utility. So this means uh, for comparison that we're not talking about games where the end result is getting something like money, where uh, in those scenarios, the members of the coalition could discuss among themselves how they want to split up the money reward. That would be a case of transferable utility. In the case of non-transferable utility, the assumption is that whatever the goals for individual people are, uh, are things that can't be transferred between each other very easily. This could be things like the benefit you derive from ending up in a group with a friend or something like that, where you can't just give that value you intrinsically get from being around a friend to another person in the coalition. So additionally, the preferences that agents have over which coalition they end up in depend upon entirely the coalition they end up in. So this is to clarify that agents don't care about anything outside of their coalition 
in terms of the utility they end up uh, deriving. Uh, last, uh, last part here is that, and this is what complicates many hedonic games, is that there are exponentially many ways that agents can be partitioned. So uh, it is intractable to take a brute force approach to these games in most cases. So some applications and problems that have been addressed with hedonic games include things like roommate selection. I'm wrapping up into roommate selection, things like the stable marriage problem as well. Uh, we could also look at things like political party formation, where people are organizing into groups with similar beliefs. Um, legislative voting, which is similar to political party formation, but slightly different insofar as you can have groups that need to gather, that may need to cooperate, even though they don't have the same beliefs, to achieve some legislative goal, like passing a certain law. And uh, another, another one that I found interesting was online game matchmaking, which was looked at by uh, Matt Spradling and Dr. Goldsmith in a 2013 ADT paper. Uh, there have been other papers looking at that, but that was one of the uh, uh, earlier ones that I've seen looking at that particular application, and it's one that I found interesting myself. So uh, some other Continuing on with the background, I've got a fair amount of this to try and uh, frame the results and such that I'll be going through a bit later. So there's also this concept of stability with hedonic games, which is examining how, not, so, not uh, how likely, but examining whether or not a given partition, so you divided up all the agents into coalitions, now the question is, will that partition remain stable or will some part of it break, break down somewhere? And we technically have two stability notions here, but I have blocking coalition in here as its own definition to uh, provide some background for core stability. So first up, we've got Nash stability, where the general idea here is that uh, you can't, no single agent can leave their current coalition and go somewhere else, whether that be to go off on their own and become a singleton or go and force themselves upon some other group. No single agent can just act unilaterally to improve their personal outcome. Now, uh, next up, I'm going to discuss a blocking coalition, which I've got kind of the mathematical definition here, but the gist of this is that a coalition we'll call C, blocks an existing partition pi if all of the agents in this currently non-existent coalition C are just as well off or better off in C than they are in whichever coalition they're currently in. Uh, an additional requirement here is that there's at least one person that could be in this coalition C that is strictly better off in C than they are in, uh, in pi, or in their current coalition. And this forms the basis of core stability, which says that there are no coalitions that block the partition that you're looking at. There are a couple other things we're going to look at, and this will be more applicable with the, when I get into the discussion about internal stability, but, there are these notions that uh, commonly are applied to uh, Nash stability, but we've looked at these in reference to internal stability. These concepts are the price of anarchy and the price of stability, where the idea behind the price of anarchy is assuming that everyone is acting selfishly, what is the worst case outcome that we can have that remains stable? Uh, price of stability takes a slightly different, well, takes kind of an opposite approach and looks at what is the best case outcome we can achieve uh, under this notion of stability. So essentially, is there some utility that we're sacrificing in order to achieve stability? 
then after going through those definitions, we've got another brief just place to take a breather there. <clears throat> just have a nice other picture for a nice break. Now we're going to start talking about some classes of hedonic games that I will uh, mention in reference to both internal stability and uh, super altruistic hedonic games. So uh, first class of games I'll talk about is what's called fractional hedonic games. These are a subclass of hedonic games where each agent assigns a utility value to each other agent. And the overall utility that an agent gets from a coalition is the average from is the average of the utility values of the other agents they end up in the coalition with. So if I've got two friends or if I've got two people in the coalition with me, I'll look at the utility values I assign to the two of them, take the average, and that's my utility for the coalition. <clears throat> Next up, I'll talk about additively separable hedonic games, where the idea here, uh, the first part is similar in that agents will assign values to each other and but instead of taking the average, we take the sum of those values to get the utility. Uh, since the difference between these two isn't the main focus of the presentation, I'm not going to dig into that too much, but I will just say that there have been uh, several papers that have looked at these two classes of games and there are different results that come out of them. So uh, though they might sound a bit similar, they do present different results in some cases. And actually, uh, in later in this paper, we'll see at least one case where they have different results. So I'll be talking about a couple more classes of games, but before I dig into that, I want to talk about this notion of friends and enemies, uh, because that will be relevant for the other classes of games I'll talk about. It is also relevant for super altruistic canonic games. So in, many in several classes of hedonic games, we will try to simplify the way that agents view each other into a question of, are you a friend or are you an enemy? And often what we'll see in these cases is a graph where edges between two nodes indicate that the agents uh, see each other as friends. Now, the graph I have up here currently is undirected, but we can also represent it as a directed graph but that would get a bit uh, cluttered, I think. So I decided to just stick with a undirected graph here. So, uh, there we go. <clears throat> so, okay. So we've now got uh, friend and enemy oriented hedonic games where these are the seem to be the first two that really dug into the idea of agents are either friends and friends or enemies. Uh, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. In the case of friend oriented hedonic games, you have a primary goal of maximizing the number of friends in your coalition and a secondary goal of minimizing enemies. In enemy oriented hedonic games, you're basically looking to do the opposite. So first you want to minimize enemies and once you've done that, then you want to find however many friends you can get into the coalition which then builds up to altruistic hedonic games, which you may uh, note sounds somewhat similar to super altruistic hedonic games. We'll be talking about that relation in a minute, but uh, first I'll talk about these. So altruistic hedonic games is, are going to look at modeling a case where I, as an agent in the game, want to find a way to basically incorporate how well off my friends are, and that is my friends that end up in the same group as me. So the utility that you get is based not just on how many friends and enemies you yourself have, but the number of friends and enemies of each of your friends. And there's a couple ways that this is uh, a couple ways that this is aggregated. <clears throat> uh, the authors presented three, as they called it, paradigms for these, those being the selfish first paradigm, where your primary concern is your own number of friends and enemies. You can then use 
the uh, preferences of your friends as basically tiebreakers. There is the equal treatment paradigm where you don't distinguish between your own preferences and those of your friends. You take all of them together as an aggregate to determine your overall utility. And then there's the altruistic first paradigm where you will first ask your friends, well, what do you guys think about this coalition we've ended up in? And then if there ends up being ties, you will use your own preferences to break those ties. So now that we've had all that build up, we're going to talk about super altruistic canonic games, which you may, the uh, picture here was a callback to when we were first looking at this class of games, the name reminded us of a uh, certain umbrella carrying British nanny. So I've included a silhouette of said nanny on this slide here is just a callback to that. And now we'll dig into the details. So the general concept here is kind of extending the idea of altruistic hedonic games beyond just looking at your friends to looking at potentially friends of friends and further out along the relationship graph. So this can potentially mean that you may consider the preferences of all other agents in your coalition, regardless of whether they're friends or not. Um, the idea behind why we took this approach is that is kind of the idea of let's say you're analyzing the utility as it were of agents picking homes in a neighborhood or on a floor in a dormitory or something you know it is there is some benefit to getting along well with your neighbors it might not be quite as significant as getting along with the people in your own house in your own dorm room but there is still some benefit to getting along well with say the people that live next door the people that live, that live across the street and so that's kind of the idea that we wanted to model here is where you're looking a bit beyond your immediate scenario and just broadening the scope a little bit. And we figured the way a good way to do that would be to uh, take into account the preferences of other people in your coalition. So to construct these, we've got a pretty good number of parameters here. First of all, we've got a friendship graph. This could be either directed or undirected, indicating uh, which agents regard each other as friends, or we would more term, we term it enemy, but when we say enemy here, it's eh, more so referring to a not friend, more so than strictly an enemy, I suppose. But uh, to use existing uh, terminology, we're sticking with friend and enemy. So We've got that friendship graph. We've got parameters indicating the weight, the weights that you assign to friends and enemies. So how import, how much utility do you, do you derive from a friend being here? How much utility do you perhaps lose from an enemy being there? There are also weights for how you get, how you weigh your opinions versus those of others, as well as uh, for some level of simplification, we also include kind of a uh, sets for each agent indicating their friends and enemies. You can derive this from the graph, but uh, we figure it may be useful to include that as a separate parameter. And then we've got a function that we'll call D of I and J, which is polynomially computable and non-increasing with the graph distance between two agents I and J. And then digging into the utility that agents derive, it is essentially based on, you look at the number of friends and enemies you have, you look at the number of friends and enemies that other people have, but you weight the consideration for the number of friends and enemies other people have based on how far separated they are from yourself uh, to some degree. So um, in our original thought here, the idea was that this D of I and J would be the inverse graph distance. So this would be you uh, weight, you do not decrease the uh, 
value you assign to immediate friends, but you weigh the opinions of friends of friends half as heavily as uh, your own friends. And then you would weigh friends of friends of friends as with a third and so on and so forth. Uh, that seemed like a logical way to look at it, but as we were constructing these, we decided that it might be helpful to consider other types of, uh, of uh, functions, and we'll dig into some of the reasoning why in a few moments. So uh, going on to the results that we got for these super altruistic hedonic games, uh, first up is a fairly unsurprising result, honestly, but it is one that it was the basically first result that we really proved here. And that is that strict coarse, strictly core stable partitions or strict core stable partitions are not guaranteed to exist, even when friend enemy relationships are symmetric. Uh, this stands in contrast with uh, some other, this isn't a surprising result, but it does stand in some contrast to uh, friend oriented hedonic games, which uh, super altruistic hedonic games can generalize. So it's not particularly surprising, but it is a uh, one of the first results that we proved and so on. So the more surprising result though, is that we found that Nash stable partitions aren't guaranteed to exist even when friend and enemy relationships are symmetric. So the reason why this is surprising is that for both friend and friend oriented hedonic game, I'm getting ahead of myself here a bit, sorry. Uh, for many classes of hedonic games that we've looked at, uh, Nash stability or Nash stable partitions will usually exist. So it is interesting to find that uh, Nash, st eh, that Nash stable partitions may not exist even when those relationships are, are uh, symmetric. Um, it's a bit less surprising when we allow asymmetric relations. So this is a case where I view you as a friend, but you may view me as an enemy. In cases like that, it's fairly easy to find games that are not Nash stable. Actually, the scenario I just said, you know, two agents where one views the other as a friend, the other does not. Uh, that would not have a Nash stable outcome because the I view the other agent as a friend, so I want to go join their coalition, but they view me as an enemy, so they just want to want me to stay away. So I'll go join them, then they'll leave, and so on and so forth. Uh, the proof that we used for this symmetric case of super altruistic hedonic games ends up achieving something similar, but we end up uh, relying on a slightly more complex graph than just two agents where one views the other as a friend and the other does not reciprocate. Um, what ends up happening with this graph that we see here is that agents will generally tend to group, you'll generally see the agents two, three, four, and five form a group, six, seven, eight, and nine will form a group. Then agent one will just kind of pick between one of the two groups and agent 10, despite not being a direct friend of agent one, will prefer to go join the same group as agent one. The problem is that agent one will then not want to be around agent 10, so they'll leave their current group, go to the other group, and so we establish a cycle where uh, no, none of the configurations we can get here end up being stable. And as I'm coming to this slide, I, uh, it occurs to me that perhaps I should have put this a bit earlier. When, when I was initially going through presentation, I thought that this would work better down here, but well, now that I've done, now that we're here, I realize eh, it would have been better if I reorganized it a bit differently. Anyways, so super altruistic hedonic games can generalize a couple classes of hedonic games that we've talked about so far. These being enemy-oriented hedonic games, friend-oriented hedonic games, and selfish first altruistic hedonic games. So uh, the, that, uh, these generalizations are why we talked about 
uh, those classes of games earlier on because super altruistic hedonic games generalize them. And I see that I'm getting a bit low on time, so I will move on to our next segment. So uh, another just brief breather transition as we move into internal stability, which is now something mm, mostly different from super altruistic hedonic games, but it still falls into the hedonic game space. So <clears throat> internal stability, the motivating ideas for this uh, research were that we want to consider a scenario where communication between coalitions is limited, but coalitions may stay may still break apart at some point. So this is kind of a middle ground between core stability and Nash stability, where in core stability, any agents from any coalitions can decide to leave and go off and make a new coalition of their own. Um, the main point here being that multiple agents can uh, cooperate to form a new coalition and break away from wherever they are currently. In the case of Nash stability, a single agent can leave and just do their own thing. Uh, what we want to look at is can agents from just a single coalition cooperate to break away from their current coalition? That's the idea of internal stability. Now, uh, the idea of internal stability was first discussed in 2006 by uh, Dimitrov, Borm, uh, Hendricks, and Sung. Uh, but they framed it just looking at a single coalition. And since then, there hasn't really been much attention given to it. They used this notion of a coalition's internal stability in one of the proofs in their 2006 paper. We wanted to expand it to look at just a, uh, as a partition stability question. And so we're uh, saying a partition is internally stable if all of its coalitions are internally stable per the uh, Dimitrov uh, definition here. So first up, we have some comparisons to try and distinguish it from other uh, stability notions. So a because of the way that agents break away from coalitions under internal stability, we observe that core stability will guarantee internal stability for all classes of hedonic games. Uh, however, internal stability does not guarantee core stability. So we can have a case where a game, where a where a partition is internally stable but not core stable, but we cannot have a situation where a partition is core stable but not internally stable. Uh, the other thing we wanted to compared to is Nash stability to distinguish it there. And we have found that there are some classes of games where Nash stability does not guarantee internal stability and other cases where it does. So this we think uh, evidences that there are cases where that uh, the two stability notions are distinct. And we've got a couple of games that we mentioned where they are or are not distinct from each other. Uh, we no mostly notice that uh, Nash stability guarantees eternal stability for enemy-oriented hedonic games. Now, moving on to uh, the rest of our results and trying to wrap things up for too much longer. Uh, a quick result for Price of Anarchy is that we generally find that Price of Anarchy is unbounded in any case where singletons are permitted per the structure of the game. So this is most of the hedonic games that we've Actually, it is all the hedonic games we've talked about today. And what ends up happening is in all of these games, a singleton being off by theirself nets zero utility. And what you end up with is if everyone is off on their own, then everyone ends up with zero utility, which is going to be worse than any uh, outcome with a, uh, is better than any positive outcome. And so, the price of anarchy ends up being unbounded or infinity in most classes of games. Uh, the more interesting result we found was looking at price of stability, where we found that there are some cases where the price of stability is unbounded. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skim over that bit. It 
ends up with a similar situation to the price of anarchy result in a very short sense. But we also found that it is, the price of stability is bounded by one in the case of additively separable hedonic games and by two for fractional hedonic games. Unfortunately, I don't believe that I have time to dig into the uh, proofs of that too much. Uh, perhaps I can discuss that uh, if anyone else is interested later on at some point. But we'll try and wrap up. So uh, last bit I've got here is just a brief summary of what all we talked about. We introduced hedonic games, super altruistic hedonic games, presented some stability results. Then we introduced internal stability, briefly talked about what makes it unique, and then moved on to some other results. Okay, and that is it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me, uh, 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 stop the sharing. Okay, so, uh, welcome again can to I, everyone. Can I ask you a question? Um, you can, but we are out of time for this presentation, Ken. If you want to ask a question, it eats into your time, but go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah, I don't mind eating into my own time. So, <laughs> um, Jacob, when in these games, and I'm sorry if I missed this, uh, what is the uh, visibility of each participant into the other participants uh, preferences does everybody have knowledge of everybody's preferences or is there some hiding there that is a good question it seems to depend on the specific incarnation of uh, games we're looking at so in altruistic hedonic games and super altruistic hedonic games there is a built-in assumption that agents are aware of the preferences of other agents um, in cases where we look at uh, core stability, we, there is some, you may not necessarily know what the other agents direct preferences are, but you can derive some information about that by say whether or not they want to cooperate to form a new coalition or not. So in a case like friend or enemy oriented hedonic games, uh, you may not really know that much about the preferences of other people. So it does kind of just depend on the specific game that you're looking at. Okay, so maybe we could talk about this more later because I, I think there might be an ap application to this in the context of interdomain routing mm -hmm. uh, where people, uh, providers don't want to reveal their own preferences, but they may want to form these kinds of coalitions. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we could talk about that in the future. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. That was uh, interesting, and I'm sure people will ask you questions by email uh, afterwards. Okay. Um, so now.